Hey everyone, Pastor Curtis here with another quick question video. Andrew and Jessela asked, why does one verse mean something one day and mean something else another day, such as how to dress? And my answer is, with all verses, there is a major problem. And that problem is the way that people hear them and use them is often very wrong, which means that some people will hear one verse one way and use it that way, while other people will hear the exact same verse another way and use it in a completely different way. So why is that? Often, it's because verses are taken out of context. See, the verses surrounding each verse are so important to help us understand that verse. You can't just pick and choose what you like from the Bible and say it's right just because it came from a Bible verse. You actually have to study. Look at the verses, look at that verse, and then look at the verses around it, and that will help you decide what the actual meaning is. And not only that, another way of context is what was happening historically in that time period. What was going on in the life of the author or the life of the people of God during that period. And then another contextual way to read a verse is in the whole picture of the Bible. Does this seem to contradict the Bible? And so I think I'd encourage you that if you hear someone use a verse and you wonder if that's the right way it should be used, write it down and then go study that verse for yourself. God gave us each verse with a very specific set of themes and ideas behind each and every verse. See, God intends each verse for exact meanings. And often Christians and non-Christians alike Take the verses, they pull them out of context and make them fit whatever they want them to say rather than study and see what God meant for that verse to say. Here are some examples of what that might look like. How about Matthew 7 verse 1, which says, Judge not lest you be judged. This verse is often used by people to basically say, hey, mind your own business, leave me alone. I'll do what I think is right and you do what you think is right, so stop judging me. Christians aren't supposed to judge, right? And often Christians use, misuse this verse to get their friends to stop pointing out sins in their lives. When actually, if you look at the context of this verse, it's teaching us that we should actually lovingly help one another with our issues. We shouldn't be afraid to point out sin issues to each other, but we need to do it in a loving way. And that's not only in Matthew 7, but that's across the Bible, that we're supposed to help brothers and sisters when they're falling into sin. Another popular misquoted verse is Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And you might have heard someone talk about this verse as a way of saying that God's got your back no matter what you do, and that a real Christian will always have success in what they do because of this verse. But that's completely wrong. See, Paul wrote this verse, and Paul had a really rough and tough life. But he wrote this verse to show that God can carry you through those hard times and God should be your God in the good times. He's using this verse as an encouragement that if you are hungry or if you're completely fed, if you're in prison or if you're free, if you have a lot of money or if you barely have any money, that no matter what, your focus should always be on God who is there for you to help you. He's not saying that if you use this verse, you too can be a great NBA superstar or magically erase all your fears and worries or score that game-winning point. It has nothing to do with that, but what it has to do with is with trusting in God in every moment. In Jeremiah 29, 11, you might have heard this verse, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. See, a famous group of people will use this to push the prosperity gospel. And often they use this verse to tell people that God is going to do something amazing with their life and make them extraordinarily wealthy and happy forever. 
But the problem is, if you look at the surrounding passage of this verse, God is actually talking to people who are captive in slavery, in a sense. They're not in their home country. And God tells them, as a matter of fact, you're going to have to wait 70 more years before you're going to be released from captivity. See, God was still in control, and this verse was to encourage them that even though their life was hard, that they needed to keep their faith in God, who has amazing plans for the future, and not to fear and not to complain their current circumstances. That's what this verse meant. Not that God would just give you everything that you need and always hand it over to you, and that some future plan is always the best coming down the road. Sometimes life is full of trials and struggles. And for those people in that verse, it was full of 70 years of slavery, basically. Lastly, Revelation 3.20, where it says, I stand at the door and knock. Many of you have probably heard that verse as an encouragement for people to accept Jesus as their savior. Like Jesus is just waiting for us to knock and he will open the door and accept anyone who is willing to ask. But did you realize that this verse is actually addressed to Christians? If you look at what's happening in Revelation 3, you'll realize this verse is a warning to Christians that we too often push Jesus away out of our hearts. We push him out of our lives and try to become self-sufficient. We forget our need for Jesus and we forget our need for him to be our savior. So in actuality, this verse is warning us that Jesus, Jesus is the one waiting outside the door of our hearts, ready to be let back in. It's actually Jesus who is doing the knocking, wanting to be the most important part of our life. The full verse is this. It says, here I am, Jesus says it. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus is waiting to, for us to open the door as Christians to our hearts and let him rule in us once again and to put away our selfish desires. So my answer is for this video, read each verse in context. I'm going to do part two of this question tomorrow about how a Christian should dress. But until then, I hope that you'll use verses in the correct context in the ways that God meant for us to understand them. And if you ever have a question about that, send the verse to me and say, hey, this is what I heard about this verse. Does that sound right? And I'll encourage you and I'll walk you through looking at a verse in context and understanding what God really wants us to know from a verse. God bless you, and I hope this video encourages you today, and I'll help you I hope you'll tune in for part two tomorrow.